Deep in your memory, deep in the dreaming, deep beneath the beating of your ancient heart, there burns a spirit, a strong, noble spirit. Remember, deep beyond memory, back before the dreaming, deep in the blood that is flowing through our bodies, we are the people, we are the children, the children of the land of the scholar and the poet. Remember our heritage, hold on to its beauty. Quaint Family Voices is a project from the National Family Museum at Strokestown Park and has been supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs since its inception in 2017. It is one of a number of Making History Visible projects, taking the story out from behind the walls of the museum and into many local, national, international and cyber spaces. Now, we not only hold the story in the museum, but reach out to others who hold the story, mainly in North America, where the other half of this story lives. The Great Famine Voices website is one of the largest repositories of famine emigrants and 19th century emigration stories. We have gathered stories from most cities in the US, Canada and the United Kingdom through our open house uh, sessions, all viewable on the website by location. We are grateful to Professor Mark McGowan of the University of Toronto. Uh, for the work he has done on the specific cohort of famine emigrants from Dennis Mahan's estate in Strokestown, our missing 1490, who are remembered in the new National Famine Way Trail in Ireland. Over two-thirds of Strokestown's 1490 were women and children, those who suffer most during traumas. Here we are indebted also to the late Mariano Gallagher for her work on the orphan list. It is true to say that the majority of families only have fragments of whispered stories passed down over decades and generations. Much of the trauma was veiled in silence. And families struggled to piece together their lives in a new land with a new language. This video gives you a glimpse of the stories passed down in three famine emigrant families where some details of their harrowing journeys were passed from generation to generation and thankfully documented. It is in their memory that we share these stories with you here. One of the most comprehensive and moving handings down of a famine story was told to us by Jennifer Robinson, especially when she informed us that her descendant Edward Neary had come from Elfin, County Roscommon, a town just a few miles from Strokestown and encompassed by the Dennis Mahan Strokestown estate. Jennifer Robinson informed us that her grandmother had vowed to keep their family history alive for future generations. Her unusual methodology was to turn the story into a family story read every Thanksgiving, an amazing way to hold on to their family legacy. Hello, my name is Jennifer Robinson. I'm from Hanover, Pennsylvania. Um, my Irish story is um, around 1802. We have um, Bridget Bravison. And Bridget was married to Edward Neary. And about 1846, they decided to head towards the United States. And in 1847, they left early in the year. They brought along um, Bridget's father, John Ravison. He would have been about 80 years old. They brought along their six children. And we all know it was the Great Famine of 1847. We know that they were headed towards Quebec and they were the first, in part of that first wave of, there was a terrible typhus going around and they started calling them the coffin ships. And they were part of that first wave of landing in Quebec, do we set up hospitals, do we set up tents, and they started building all of these onshore tents to, to hold as many of these people as possible. They're coming off the ships, they're getting sick, and people are dying. So during the journey of the Irish ship, 
Um, Grandfather John passed away and was buried at sea. And we do know that from a record. Um, and plus it's part of the family history. And Father Edward Neary, who was the teacher of the family and teacher in Elfin, Ireland, uh, passed away on the shore of Quebec. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it chokes me up. Because I can't imagine what Bridget went through watching her husband and four of her children die in a matter of four or five days. And... Um, <clears throat> Their bodies are not buried anywhere. There was 7,000 people who died on that shore. And um, they're in a mass burial grave and there's just a memorial there. But we know that Bridget and her two children survived and they went to Governor St. Lawrence County, New York. Bridget lived another 30 years. She was about 88 when she died. Um, her photo, though, when I look at it, kind of haunts me. I can't imagine what she went through. She, uh, just looking at her, what she went through, what she lost. So it reminds me. And it reminds me of my fam family, my mom reminding me of Irish St. Patrick's Day every year, which I never really paid attention to. So we know that they went to St. Lawrence County and also Jane, who was the daughter who lived, she survived and she also married another Irish person from the McCabe family, who was also from Elfin, Ireland, who also immigrated the same year. I don't know enough about his history or his family, but I do know about mine. Um, son Edward grew up to be a judge in St. Lawrence County and uh, he went on to have two grown children himself who had families and were the descendants. So Edward Neary grew up and uh, became a judge and a lawyer in his town. That would be Edward. And um, newspaper accounts say that Edward, when he would speak from his judge's bench, would have that distinct Irish voice. He, wasn't, he wouldn't talk down to people, but he liked to use that Irish tone. <laughs> um, I do know that all of the photographs that I have of Edward have lots of family around him. And this would be Edward's house. It's a cabin he built in the Adirondacks, and he named it after Elfin, the town he came from. But it's very interesting to me that to see him with so much family around because I think from his roots, what they must have left behind and what he lost when he was a child, that he just loved having all of these people, family members and friends, come visiting him a lot. So I think it's a, it's a testimony to, his, to whatever they must have gone through in those years. I don't have a lot of information about what they went through we know facts, we know things from census, and we know things from newspaper accounts, which can portray a little bit more of Edward's, more of his livelihood and what he did around town and who he was hanging with and, and his influence in his town. And I think that his Irish influence was definitely something that he wanted to leave behind. And it's definitely carried on with the family. Um, my mom was the, the big researcher in our family. She wrote a simple grandchildren's story about the ship's story and the voyage of the Neary family coming to the United States. And we read it every year on Thanksgiving, which <clears throat> I think it's, it would be important for Edward to know and the Neary's to know that, that we still think about them and we still think about what they went through and and what they left behind. And uh, I hope my family gets to go see Ireland because we have roots there and, and our blood is there. And we have people there who are, who are family and buried there. So I'm looking forward to seeing Ireland very soon. Here is an excerpt from the Robinson Neary Thanksgiving story. Edward Neary, son of Tobias and Bridget, was born in Castlereagh on November 10, 1800. 
Young Edward grew up to become a school teacher. He married Bridget Brabazon and taught in the chapel of a church in Ballyroddy near Elfin, where the priest came Sunday mornings from a neighbouring town to celebrate Mass. Bridget's family lived in this locality. We do not know the reason the Nearys decided to leave Ireland, but starvation and starvation-related diseases had already caused the death of a million. Perhaps there was no pay for a school teacher. Perhaps many of the other families had left to find a better life. Or perhaps there were no more children to teach. There must have been must, much discussion about leaving the only place they had known. He had been teaching 23 and a half years, but at the age of 47, Edward reluctantly made the decision to take his wife and his six children and his wife's father, John Brabazon, and leave Ireland to start a new life in another country. Young Ed was 12 and a half years old at the time. He was eager to go on a ship, but unsure about leaving. He had listened to his father. He knew all about the problems in Ireland. His father had taught him well. He loved his land. Ed was filled with nervous anticipation. He couldn't wait to see the ship. As they stood on the quay, he could make out the name. It was Grace. This was Monday, April 12th, 1847. On Monday, May the 24th, they arrived at Gros Isle, a quarantine station. It was the place of both beauty and of suffering. Some called it the Isle of Death. We can only speculate what hardships Edward Neary and his family may have suffered as they anticipated reaching their final destination. They must have spent much time looking out towards the land where their imagined new life would begin. It was so close now. It was to be a long two week wait. They gazed longingly at the land. Seagulls circled above. They were a welcome sight. The sound of them like music. When they looked down upon the water, it was littered with refuse, ugly and dirty. Over and over the children asked, when do we get to Montreal? When do we get to our new home? There were rumours about illness and death. Some children had been orphaned, they said. They heard that churches and hospitals and tents were becoming crowded. Fever sheds were being set up. What would happen if one of them became ill? Would they be able to call a doctor? It wasn't until Monday, June 7th, that Ed, his parents, brothers and sisters, arrived in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. They had finally made it. There were so many people arriving that in Montreal, emergency hospitals and passenger sheds were erected. An offensive smell arose from the night soil and garbage, which piled up around the tents and fever sheds. Filth was not removed regularly, owing to the apparent disregard of emigrants for personal cleanliness and the helplessness of their physical conditions. It was the end of June and getting very warm. They were not used to such heat. Father Edward was the first to show symptoms. It began with a high fever, he had pain in his muscles and his joints ached. Then there was a terrible headache. By the fifth day, the telltale red spots and dark red rash began to appear spreading all over his body. He became delirious and finally, on July the 1st, the most awful thing happened. Edward died. The whole family were in mourning. Father was dead. Not only had father died, but the temperature was now 98 degrees. What were they to do now? Ed felt as though he couldn't even think it was so hot. They weren't prepared for this. Soon after, big brother Michael and sister B began to show the dreaded symptoms. Then several days later, James. 
His mother didn't know what to do when baby Eliza became sick as well. She took her to the hospital. There seemed to be nothing they could do to stop it. Michael and B died on the same day, the 11th of June. His big brother was gone. Ed could hardly believe this. His grandfather, then his father, now Michael and B. He prayed to God. Please save James, pleaded Ed. I'm sorry for teasing him, I want him to live. But three days later, James died. Eliza died about the same time in Montreal Hospital. Why had this happened? This was the worst time of young Ed's life and now their money was gone too. So many people had died that they had to be buried in a mass grave near the Canadian Pacific Railway Bridge along with 7,000 other emigrants. They were buried in their ordinary clothes, no coffins for protection, no proper funeral for them either. Now, it was just Mam and Anna. He wasn't close to Anna. She was much older. She acted more like his mother. Now they clung to each other. Bridget Neary was destitute. This was not the way they had planned it. Ed was now the man of the family. Had they made the right decision? Where would they even live? The next month, August, Bridget Neary and her remaining two children, Edward and Anne, left for Cornwall. It was not until July 12, 1848, they settled in Ogdenburg, New York. He still had his ma and sister Anne, didn't he? They looked ahead to a new beginning. His father, his brothers, his sisters, they were still a part of him, a part of who he was, and who he would become. Tragedy and death are inevitable parts of life. Tough lessons for a boy so young. But Ed went on to lead a long, full, and quite remarkable life. Poignantly, Jennifer and her daughter Tony uh, did travel to Ireland and did Edward's journey in reverse, returning for the Irish Famine Summer School in June 2018. At that time, they were introduced to local historian Cyril McDermott, who rather beautifully was able to bring them to the Brabazon home place in Ballyroddy in Alfin. So they got to see the very lands that he had left in 1847. A heartwarming end to a search and a homage to the tenacity of her grandmother in the holding fast to that part of their heritage. Our next story follows the Quinn family. In 1847, James Quinn and his wife, Margaret Peggy Lyons Quinn, decided to avail of Major Dennis Mahan's assisted emigration scheme, leaving their home in Lissanuffy uh, after it had been tumbled. They had four children, Patrick 12, Thomas 6, Joseph 3, and another child, age and forename unknown. In June, they set out along with many of their neighbours as part of the Strokestown's 1490 famine emigrants, escorted by Bailiff Robinson on the long 165 kilometre trek from Strokestown to Dublin, which now forms the National Famine Way, a trail in memory of the 1490. From Dublin, they travelled open deck on a steam packet ship to Liverpool. There, they were held up some days and housed most likely in one of the numerous fetid basements in the Liverpool Quays. On June 15, 1847, with 415 other famine emigrants, mostly our 1490, they boarded the ill-fated ship Naomi and set off in hopes of a new life in North America. The dream was to become a nightmare voyage of 45 days at sea, followed by being held 11 days further in quarantine, decked off Gros Isle, before being disembarked on August 10th. It is most likely that Joseph and his unnamed sibling died and were buried at sea. James, Margaret 
and their two sons, Patrick 12 and Thomas 6, disembarked at the Grosseil quarantine station. Both James and Margaret were unwell. We can hardly imagine the dismay of these two little boys when their mother passed away on Grosseil the week of August 14th. Then, the last week in August, these two bewildered little boys were led to their father's deathbed, where with his dying words, he urged them to remember your soul and your liberty. Words they never forgot. Our next story is about the Thai family. The Thai story mirrors the story of the Quinn in many ways. Both families were from Lissanuffy, outside Strokestown, and both families were part of our 1490 and travelled the same journey from to Dublin, to Liverpool, and on to Quebec on the ship Naomi. Both families also suffered traumatic tragedies. Bernard Thai from Lissanuffy married Mary Kelly from Tulsk. By the time the famine hit, they had had five children. Bernard died before 1847. We do not know how. Perhaps of hunger. Mary is left alone as a widow with five children to rear. Without her husband by her side to provide for the family, Mary falls into arrears on her small plot in Lissanuffy and threatened with an eviction notice by Major Dennis Mahan, her landlord, also offered a second option if she gave her farm up peacefully, that of paying her and her children to leave Ireland in search of a new life on another continent, thousands of miles from their home. In a desperate attempt to save her family, Mary, afraid of travelling alone, convinces her brother William Kelly to travel with her and her children. As a group of seven, we see them travel under William's name, as part of our 1490, they walked to Dublin, a long, hard trek for five small children. They then travelled to Liverpool, where they wait in the horrific, insanitary conditions for a ship to take them to Canada. On the 15th of June, 1847, William, Mary and their five children, along with the Quinns, embarked on the Naomi. Of this journey, Daniel said to his grandson, Leo Ty, the voyage was a long nightmare of eight weeks. Drinking water ran low and food was reduced to one meal a day. Comfort and hygiene were non-existent. Despite Major Mahan paying for extra provisions, it would appear his tenants did not receive them. Mary was to succeed in her mission to save her family, but was to pay a high price that of her life, her brother's life, and the lives of three of her children. Daniel, age 12, and Catherine, age nine, were the only two members of the family to survive. From Grosseil, the orphans were brought to the orphanage in Quebec. A parish priest from outside Quebec took the orphans into his care, and on his journey back to his parish, met with Francois Colomb from Lobinière. The Colombs were a childless elderly couple with a farm of 168 acres and in search of a boy to help them work it. They chose Daniel. As they walked away, little Catherine went hysterical, ran after him clinging to his leg. He was the only person in the world that she knew. The Colombs watched this scene, turned around and said, On va prendre les deux. We will take them both. And they did, and they left them their name, and these two small children found themselves on a 168-acre farm, a world away from a half-acre in Lissanuffy, and a world away from everything they knew and loved. The Colombs treated them well, and Daniel inherited the farm, which his great-grandson, Richard Tai, still lives on in 2020. Catherine went to work as a priest's housekeeper before returning to live with Daniel and sadly dying of appendicitis in her 30s. Daniel went on to marry Virginia and they had eight children, four boys and four girls. He has many, many descendants living today. He called his oldest child Mary after his mother 
but interestingly, none of the other seven children were named after the Thai family. In the year 2000, Jim Callery, founder of the National Famine Museum at Strokestown Park, met Leo Thai in Canada, Daniel's grandson then in his 90s. Leo had lived with his grandfather until his death in 1923, when Leo was 17 years old. So he had heard him many times recount firsthand the story of the Thai journey. In 2013, as part of the gathering, the Strokestown community invited Richard Thai back home. So 166 years after little Daniel left, the Thai family set foot on Irish soil again in a closing of their family circle. Following you will see videos of Jim Callery interviewing Leo Thai and of some of the RTE nationwide coverage of the Thai's return to Strokestown. <laughs> And he would tell the story. Uh, the of the people on board were orphans. Had their parents had died of typhus. They wrapped them up in and they stopped here. Le, le groupe uh, avec le prêtre, le groupe d'orphelins avait arrêté ici à saint croix pour prendre un repas, n'est-ce pas? Et c'est oui. comme ça que Colombe a trouvé Daniel. C'est le curé de Le Bénière, c'est un curé dans le temps. Il y a le curé de Le Bénière, about 10 months. Il n'y avait pas de téléphone, mais il a pris ça. C'est avec la fille, je pense. Probablement parce qu'il y avait le, le chemin de fer. Il a su, il a vu qu'il a entendu parler. Yeah. The, the priest at Lopinier knew that there were children coming and at Lopinier he was going to take care of them for his parish but as they stopped here for a meal and it was that way that, that Daniel Ah, oui. They ils ont été went... à peu près deux heures temps à l'hôpital général. Yeah. Là, ils ont resté là. Et puis le curé de Lévinaire a pris ça. Les enfants ont été pris de Bruxelles et puis il a décidé d'aller en chercher. Il s'est loué une grande voiture à un yeah. express. Il a eu deux poids de gros, puis trois sièges. À a, a three bench, le priest from here went up to Québec ouais. to get the children. And in a big wagon that he had rented with double double sized wheels, three point zero wheels. Yeah. Yeah. And they went to Saint Coulomb. He was there for a while in the garden. He said, "François, he said, 'I'm going to search for the kids here and there.' He said, 'I'm going to go to the Nation to get them.'" So on his way up to Quebec, he said, "I'm going to Quebec City to get some orphans to bring to the village, and I'd like to stop here for dinner tomorrow." Uh, when he was about, uh, when he was a boy, and the, the neighbors would come in and talk uh, and ask uh, their grand Daniel about what it was like, he didn't like to talk about the hardships of the ship in front of Daniel and his sister yeah. because uh, he found it hard to. He didn't think it was fair for the children to have to listen to uh, hardships like that that had uh, happened to him as a boy. Oui. Alors, euh, ce que j'ai à euh, que je vous ai raconté, oui. on prenait ça en cachette parce que. Oh, oh. He, and his, he and his sister used to hide ah. close to where the adults were talking and listen to them. Ah. Et puis, ça, ça, leur, ça restait gravé. So it, it remained etched Et in their memory. This summer, Strokes Town has been opening its arms to its diaspora, the generations of men and women who've left for a life elsewhere. Some because they wanted to, some because they had to. 
but the pull of home is strong and they've been coming back. of reunions with family and friends and back to an ecumenical welcome home service. For Richard Ty, this service has a very special meaning. Famine forced the family of his great-grandfather Daniel to leave Strokestown for Canada in 1847. Daniel was 12 then. His father had already died. When the ship berthed at Gros Isle in Quebec, Daniel and his sister Catherine were orphans. Before the Thai family reached the other side, the mother was dead, three of the children were dead, and they were thrown overboard. That is the story. That is the reality. Going home, going home, I'm just going home. In turn, Richard and his wife, Louisette, have been exploring his Irish roots. Daniel, son of Bernard and Mary Kelly. Seeing the baptismal record of his great-grandfather, Daniel, and visiting pre-famine Thai graves. And Thai, who died on the... February. Fe uh, 1827. Okay, age, fo age 40 years. Of Strokestown's missing 1490, over one third lost their lives. Very few were able to attain the emigrants' cherished dream of returning home. In a rather ironic twist, one other person who did lose their life due to the famine emigration scheme was Major Dennis Mahan, who was assassinated on November 2nd, 1847, after word of the numerous deaths on his ill-fated scheme reached Strokestown. Two things that stand out for me in these and other emigrant stories we have collected I find it interesting how many families hold their stories so close and share them from generation to generation, but still need a catalyst to initiate that return home. This is why the Great Famine Voices Project is so important, creating a bridge for some to return. As you have seen, from amidst the death and trauma, there were survivors who went on to live long, fulfilled and prosperous lives. Our three families see a judge, two priests and a farmer on 158 acres. And the second thing that I find of note is their longevity. Edward Neary lives to 85 years. Thomas Quinn lives to 83 years. Patrick Quinn lives to 81 years and Daniel Tai lives into his 90th year. To those who did not make it and whose lives were cut short, or yes, J. Gorau Anonymaka. Our search goes on for descendants of our missing 1490 who are commemorated on the glass memorial wall at the National Famine Museum and in the National Famine Way, which follows in their footsteps of their last journey on Irish soil, that long walk from Roscommon to Dublin, which we hope one day to have for whole 1490 descendants do. Reflect on all that we, we leave you now with the renowned folk singer Declan O'Rourke singing the anthem for the National Famine Way, Godawan i Dachivna, forever to in our memory. If we can forgive, we can begin to grow. Remember, remember, remember. Godawan i Dachivna, Godawan i Dachivna, Godawan i Dachivna, Godawan i Dachivna, Ta anna mig do, anna m uasil agus tréam, kvivnig, kvivnig. Godawin riven kvivne, sara hánig an aisling, godawin sa vil a thai gritri da gorp. Is muidne an pobl, is muidne an oige, slacht na skalari, is fili ar nuiche. Kvivnig er ar nairacht, kunig lav er an oilacht, 
Can you kill our danga braver of his bill? Ach, na darma dar gahu, as an dovron galer. Can you glove her and maid her honeywood harish? As Federlin Kuvnu, as Tachter and Tishkind, as Federlin Tishkind, my foreign cree. My wife made a hale, took a borough as false. Kuvnig, Kuvnig, Kuvnig. <laughs>